per. There you go. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, understanding and coping with dementia behaviors. First of all, um, caring for someone with dementia feels like wandering into uncharted territory without a flashlight um, because it can change from day to day, from hour to hour. And then I have a quote from Rosalind Carter, former first lady. There are four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been a caregiver, those who are currently a caregiver, those who will be a caregiver, or those that will need a caregiver. And that is really the truth, um, especially as so many of us are aging and we're gonna be top heavy, more older people than younger people. So there isn't, there isn't enough help to go around. Next slide. So what are some signs of dementia just to kind of do a brief Brief summary, memory loss that disrupts daily life, um, especially recent events or learned information. Challenges in planning or solving problems, difficulty com um, completing familiar tasks, confusion with time or place, trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. This is where you start seeing uh, a lot more fender benders or they have trouble parking. They're either pulling in too far or not far enough. Um, new problems with words and speaking or writing, and not just misplacing things, but the inability to actually retrace their steps. Decreased or poor judgment and less attention to grooming. And then they started also withdrawing from some social activities. And then I have um, a few more stats, but that's okay, leave that up. Um, there are actually 16 million family caregivers caring for loved ones with dementia currently in the US. 18.5 billion of hours of unpaid care daily or 233.9 billion hours per year. 66% of the caregivers lived with their loved one and over 60% are caring for parents and children at the same time. 30 to 40% of dementia family caregivers suffer from depression compared to five to 17% of non-caregivers of the same age. And that's because it's a very difficult, challenging, stressful job to have. So what we're gonna learn about some practical strategies for dealing with the problems today, um, as it does pose many challenges. And again, dementia is a progressive brain disorder that makes it more difficult for the person to remember, think clearly and communicate with others as well as take care of themselves. And they also have impaired judgment. It can also cause mood swings and a change in their personality and behavior. And there are many types of dementia, but Alzheimer's is the most common. They say 60 to 80%. Um, vascular, frontotemporal, and Lewy bodies are less common, but certainly prevalent. And not all people with dementia experience the same behaviors or all behaviors that we will discuss today. It really depends on the type of dementia. With frontotemporal, usually it's a younger onset, but not always. My father was in his 70s when he developed it. Vascular is a little different in that you do okay for a while and then there's like a big change. And then that kind of pattern continues with vascular. Lewy bodies, you see um, more of the hallucinating and more of the aggressive behaviors. And then there are people with mixed dementias. It's not um, that uncommon for people to have more than one type of dementia. Alzheimer's and vascular are probably the most common combination. And there are stages of dementia. To keep it simple, I just talk about mild, moderate, severe, but some do break it down into seven stages or more. Next. So normally we do have changes in our five senses as we age. Um, and it usually starts when we're in our 50s. Um, but dementia then adds more to those changes or deficits. So with vision, um, they lose the ability of the brain to interpret images, which increases confusion um, and inability to recognize familiar faces and places 
and it impairs their ability to discern colors and shapes. That's why you need to show color contrast, like um, the table has to be a different color from the dishes or they may not see the dishes on the table. Smell is often the first sense to be impacted. They either confuse odors or they lack a sense of smell. Um, so you wanna keep outdated spoiled foods cleared out. Taste of course is always impacted by smell. So they could eat the spoiled foods without realizing they're spoiled. Hearing, it may be okay, but they're unable to process certain sounds. So a calm, quiet environment is optimum. A high-pitched female voice is harder for them to distinguish, like similar sounding words like mine and fine. And touch, they may not feel the hot or cold. Um, so it's good to color code fa faucets with warning stickers so that they don't burn themselves. Next. Now we're going to talk about 10 tips in approaching and caring for our loved ones that have dementia. Next. First is your attitude and body language. You want to set a positive mood for interaction, speak in a pleasant and respectful manner, show feelings of affection with your facial expressions, your tone of voice, or physical touch. Next. And you want to get the person's attention if trying to talk or even direct them for any reason. So you want to limit distractions and noise, turn off the TV or radio if you have to, close the curtains, shut the door or move to a quieter place. And before speaking, address him or her by name and identify yourself and your relation. Again, this is if it's further along and they don't really recognize you. And if he or she is seated, get down to their level to maintain eye contact and never come up to them from behind. You don't want to startle them. Next. State your message clearly. That means use simple words and sentences. Now, that doesn't mean that you use sing-songy, um, you know, like talking childish gibberish, um, even though some of their behaviors remind you of them being more childlike, they're still an adult. Um, and so we wanna to speak to them um, like they are adults. So you only wanna give one direction at a time. You wanna speak slowly and in a reassuring tone, refrain from raising your voice. And now it's a little different if they're also hard of hearing. And then they usually say, try to get up right to the ear to speak to them. And then you still may not have to speak real loud. Um, and if need be, repeat the same message or question. If they still don't understand, wait a few minutes and rephrase. And use the names of people and places instead of pronouns like he, she, or they. Because remember, they start getting confused and have more difficulty following a storyline. But maybe if you talk you know, with the names, um, they, they may follow a little easier. Next, number four, ask simple questions. Just one question at a time. It should have a yes or no response. Don't give too many choices. Um, examples, would you like to wear your white or blue shirt today? And visually show them the shirts while you're asking. Or do you want macaroni and cheese or a ham sandwich for lunch? Next. Number five, listen with your ears, eyes, and heart. Be patient and waiting for a response when you've asked a question. If they're still struggling, it's okay to suggest a couple of words and watch for nonverbal cues. Are they pointing to something? And strive to listen for meaning and feelings that underlie the words they're saying or trying to say. Next, six is managing tasks. Break down activities into a series of steps. Encourage them to do what they can. Remind them of steps and assist with the steps if he or she is no longer able to accomplish. Use visual cues such as showing him or her with your hand where to place the dinner plate on the table, for example. And put one food item on the plate and demonstrate how to use the fork. If they're not able to use the utensils any longer, they don't remember how to manage them, uh, you can start providing finger foods. Seven, when the going gets tough, if they become upset or agitated, try changing the subject, change the environment, suggest a walk, 
or just state, I'm sorry, you're upset. Let's go get something to eat. But somehow you're distracting them and redirecting them to something else. And hopefully that will pass quickly uh, and they won't remember why they were agitated. Eight. Respond with affection and reassurance. People with dementia often feel confused, anxious, or unsure of themselves. And they still get depressed, especially in early dementia because they kind of know what their future holds. They may recall things that never happened. Um, they may become suspicious or paranoid and accuse others of stealing. Not unusual for spouses to accuse their spouse of having an affair, which never happened. Don't try to convince them though, you won't win. Stay focused on the feeling that they're demonstrating and respond with comfort and support. And sometimes it's holding hands, hugging or praising will also work. Um, but again, you have to know your person because sometimes touch will aggravate them more. Um, next. And remember the good old days. Many people with dementia may not remember what happened 45 minutes ago or what they had for breakfast. However, they can remember their lives 45 years ago. So you wanna avoid asking questions that rely on their short-term memory. Ask about the past, share old photos, reminiscence therapy. That's where you're talking about old events. You know, you can ask them about their first kiss or their first date, or how did they meet their spouse if this was somebody that was married. Next. Maintain your sense of humor. Believe me, this is much easier said than done, but you do want to use humor whenever possible. And, you know, say things like, I do silly things like that sometimes, or you're not laughing at them, but with them. And they may still have some social skills and can laugh with you. Um, my mom also had dementia. Hers was Alzheimer's. Um, and I cannot remember what situation we were in because my mom's been gone quite a while. But um, I do remember that I asked her if she had a direct connection with God and she just started laughing because she realized that whatever she had just said was pretty silly. And take a break when you can, watch comedies. And now we'll just continue to talk about more behaviors and you know your daily ADLs and some of the problems that they, uh, they bring. So the greatest challenges, of course, are the personality and behavior changes that occur. And it's best to try and meet them by being creative, flexible, patient, and compassionate. And of course, patience, again, is very challenging to maintain all the time. And you can get impatient and you should not beat yourself up for that. Um, don't take what they say personally, because they would probably say the same thing no matter who was with them. And as mentioned um, in our last slide, try to maintain your sense of humor. And they are not doing or saying anything on purpose to aggravate you. The brain is misfiring. And this is really important to remember. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard families say that, that they really believe that they're just doing things on purpose to aggravate them. They're not. Next, we cannot change the person, so we want to try to accommodate the behavior, but not necessarily totally control it, because you can't. So if the person insists on sleeping on the floor, put a mattress on the floor, or sleep in their lounge chair, let them, give them a pillow and blanket. Um, we can change our behavior, how we react, which can ultimately result in a change in their behavior, hopefully. It's kind of like modeling, right? If we're doing something, hopefully they will follow or model. Next. Behavior has a purpose and is triggered. Um, so if it's a very sudden change in their behavior, you might want to check with the doctor. Um, it could be a urinary tract infection or some other kind of infection that is causing um, this change. Is it pain that they can't articulate to you? Are they hallucinating? There may just be a need for medication adjustment. And if they're taking out clothes from the closet every day, maybe they need to be busier. Can they help fold laundry or sweep the floor? What can they still do? It doesn't have to be perfect. And triggers may be something someone said or did. Or was there a 
change in the environment. Change can be very confusing when their routine um, is so important and, and if it gets interrupted. So try to disrupt and try a different approach. Next, but addressing pain. Well, facial expressions may be your only indication. Clenched teeth, tightly shut eyes, biting their lower lip, frowning, or they might have guarded posturing, moaning or whimpering, a restlessness that isn't usually there, or a sudden quietness. Again, it's just getting to know, just like if you've taken care of an infant, it's getting to know what their different cries mean, right? Um, and so it's learning from this end of the age spectrum. Next, wandering. People with dementia walk seemingly aimlessly, but it may be boredom, it may be a medication side effect, or they're looking for someone or something. They may wanna go home probably their childhood home. Um, ask them how old they are um, and you'll get some interesting answers. Um, my mom was going home every night and packed a few things in a jewel paper bag, but she was in the home that she had lived in for 50 years. So clearly she was going back to her childhood home. They may be hungry, thirsty, or need to use the toilet and try to get to know what their behaviors and needs are. With my mom, we just, distracted her and said, you know, it was rush hour, traffic was too heavy, we'll go later. And then, you know, it tends to pass and you don't have to take her anywhere. Next, how else can we manage the wandering? Make time for regular exercise. If their balance is impacted, you can do chair exercises. Install new locks that require a key, position them high or low, but not at eye level so that they may not notice or or find the opening. Mask the door with a curtain or place a stop sign on it. It may or may not stop them, but it's worth a try. Place a black mat on the porch. It may seem like a hole to them and they would be afraid to step out. Maybe you need a home security system if you don't have one. Put away their coat, purse, or glasses if they'll let you. My mom didn't go anywhere without her purse. Have them wear an ID and have clothes with um, their ID in them. And tell your neighbors and police that you have a wanderer. And we now have a silver search alert, just like the Amber Alert for children. I don't know if they ever found the gentleman. Um, I saw it on our neighborhood patch this week. Um, an, an older man with dementia had, um, had wandered off. Next, <clears throat> incontinence. As dementia progresses, loss of bladder and bowel does occur. Um, they may also forget where the bathroom is. So if you can establish a routine, maybe every two hours, schedule fluid intake around that schedule. You wanna keep them hydrated, but you may wanna limit the amount of fluids in the evening. Use signs for the bathroom, use a bedside commode close to their bed at night. And, but be prepared still to change bed linens. Now they do have disposable chucks, they call them. Those are those blue pads, but you can also get cloth pads that go in the washer and dryer um, just to help save on the sheets. Pull-ups um, and adult diapers work, but you do have to change them. They can't wear them all day um, and you know be sitting in urine or feces. Uh, use easy to remove clothing with elastic or Velcro that's washable. Next, verbal outbursts and threats. Well, cursing, arguing are expressions of anger or stress or not. People that never swore may do so now, more so probably with frontotemporal while they're still speaking. Um, react by staying calm and reassuring. Try to distract again or redirect their attention to something else. Household chore they can do as it makes them feel useful and productive. Baby dolls to hold, especially women um, if they've had children. Uh, plastic tools for men who were handy or worked in the trades. Next. Sexually inappropriate behavior. Masturbating or undressing in public or maybe just making lewd remarks, sexually aggressive behavior, the disease is causing this. However, sexuality does not disappear when someone has dementia. So develop an action plan before it happens, provide privacy if you can, allow masturbating if they're not hurting themselves. 
Um, next. Hallucinations and delusions. Well, hallucinations are seeing, hearing, or feeling what others don't see, hear, or feel. Delusions are false beliefs, such as someone is trying to hurt them or kill them, believing someone is in the house other than them or you, accusing someone um, of stealing money or some other items. So it's actually a false belief. Um, they believe it with their dear heart and soul, but it isn't real. But do not argue or try to reason with them. Again, you won't win and they can't reason. But we use therapeutic fibbing. Go along with the delusion, distract, keep rooms well lit or explain the noise they think they're hearing, medicate with antipsychotics. Um, these meds are prescribed. They're also uh, called a major tranquilizer. Um, but they can be effective with some of these behaviors. Next. Repetitive speech. You probably will hear this more in the beginning stages or the earlier stages. Um, it's harmless, of course, to the person with dementia, but annoying and stressful to the one providing care because they keep repeating the same thing over and over. But provide reassurance, distract with a snack or activity, avoid reminding them they just asked because they don't remember that they asked. Try to refocus them by asking them to help you. Don't discuss upcoming plans till it's time. Um, again, my mother kept asking, whose wedding were we going to? I was driving her out to Tinley and you know, I live here in the area. And what we were actually doing was going to my nephew's confirmation, so which was her grandson. And so I just kept telling her, we're not going to a wedding, mom. You know, we're going to the church, you know, for Ryan's confirmation. So we get to the church. And she sees my sister, who was Ryan's mother. She says, you didn't tell me we were going to Denise's. And I just laughed. I said, you're right, Mom, I didn't. So she did not have that relationship down at that point that Ryan was Denise's son. Post signs about time for meals or if another lives there, when they'll be home. And just try it again to learn their behaviors and triggers. Next. Agitation. Well, it can be from sleeplessness, irritability, and be exhibited by verbal or physical aggression. And it usually gets worse as dementia progresses. You're not gonna see it too mu as much in the early stage. Some triggers may be when they just feel control is taken away from them or they're afraid or they're just really fatigued. So you wanna reduce clutter, noise, and people, maintain structure with routine, Reduce caffeine and sugar, although they love their sweets. Um, again, my mom, who was never a big sweet person, she was eating those M&Ms every day. Use music, reading, walking, and reassuring. And distract again with an activity or a snack, maybe a healthier snack. Acknowledge their anger about the loss of control or frustration. Next. There are some alternative treatments um, to prescription medication, um, CBD oil. There's no THC, so they don't get high. And um, those things, sometimes it's a tincture, sometimes it's um, like an, a lotion that you rub on. Um, medical marijuana, they are actually having great results um, with the ag aggression and agitation. Um, but again, it's not covered by insurance or Medicare, so it can be expensive. But the good part about medical marijuana is that it can, you know, you should go to a doctor that is informed, well informed, and will order the right type because there are different types and also the right dosage. And, and with any kind of med, um, you always want to start low, go slow, um, and see see how much they need. Um, massage therapy, or sometimes just a simple back rub. And again, be careful with the massage therapy because not everybody responds well to touch, you know, their personal space. So you have to know your loved one. And just because something works one hour or one day doesn't mean it will the next. So you have to have several tools in your tool toolbox to kind of fall back on. Next, dressing the person. Again, use loose fitting clothing with easy zippers or snaps. When it gets to the 
you know, the end stages, you know, you're probably just going to use like a hospital gown or, you know, an easy slip on um, nightgown. <clears throat> Remove other clothing from the closet or drawers, thereby reducing their choices and thereby taking them taking everything out and um, making a mess. Lay out one outfit at a time, definitely no more than two. Again, if you still, if they can still make a choice. Remove soiled clothes. You may have to do that when they're sleeping. And don't argue if they want to wear the same outfit all the time. Just try and get it washed when they're sleeping. And try to help them stay independent as long as they can. Bathing is next. They often forget good hygiene. And this is actually like one of your earlier um, symptoms e even. They may feel frightened or embarrassed having someone help because normally it's a private activity. And what was their routine before? Did they prefer a bath to a shower? Did they do it in the morning or at night? And how many days per week or on certain days? Now, my father-in-law did not have dementia, but he was a man who just really didn't perspire and didn't smell, but he only took two showers per week, Tuesday night and Saturday night were his days. Be sure um, curtains and doors are closed. Keep a towel over the parts not being washed if you're doing a bed bath or a sponge bath with them sitting on the toilet. Is the room temperature warm enough? Um, you know, older people just from lack of muscle mass and also not as active get colder easier. Do they have a favorite powder or soap or lotion and try and use that? Do they still get their hair done at the salon? Um, you know, my mom, up till the time she had her stroke, um, she was getting her hair washed and set every week at the salon and she was getting her nails done. Non-slip mats and grab bars, shower chairs, handheld shower are all necessary um, things in the bathroom. And a fear of falling is very common with people with dementia. And again, try again later or another day if they're that agitated and fighting um, so much. Nobody wants to get hurt. You don't want them hurt. You don't want to get hurt. Next, eating. People will forget to eat or drink or how to eat, especially as it, the illness progresses. Do they have dental issues? Maybe they've lost weight because of the dementia. Maybe they don't fit as well. Make meals and snacks part of their routine. Make meals special, turn off the TV. Use finger foods and sippy cups if needed, but don't use children's sippy cups. Um, there's plenty of adult ones out nowadays. Eat with them. Are they having trouble chewing or swallowing? You may have to adjust the diet as this progresses because um, as it progresses, people do often have uh, swallowing issues. So you may have to adjust the diet from chopped to pureed, um, have thick liquids. Um, and there's a substance called thicket you can buy to mix with the liquid so that they don't um, aspirate and choke. Soft foods. Um, if they're losing uh, too much weight, you can get Ensure or some other um, dietary supplement. Old fashioned chocolate milkshake would work for me. And they're still getting some calories some liquid, um, you know, fluid intake, but they will always pick sweet treats and food first. Next, remember people with dementia may become uncooperative and resist bathing, dressing, and eating. They may feel out of control, rushed, or afraid or confused. You have to allow plenty of time because they can't move or do things as fast as we do. Reassure, break tests into steps and find ways they can assist. It is their way of coping. Sundowning. You'll see this more as you get into, uh, you know, the middle stages. Um, it's a restlessness, agitation, disorientation, wanting to go home. And it's usually by late afternoon or early evening. It's caused by changes in their biological clock um, confusing nights and days. So you want to increase activities and avoid inactivity and napping so that they will sleep at night. Uh, dietary, try and cut back on the caffeine and the sugar, um, provide smaller meals, and plan for some quiet time in the afternoon and evening. 
turn on lights early and close curtains so they're not, they don't know for sure you know what time it really is. Make sure the house is safe. Again, block stairs if you have to. Make sure the locks are on, and medicate. Um, and the caregiver may need more help because the caregiver does need sleep too in order to be patient and to function. Next. This is kind of a quick summary of um, some communication tips. Never argue, instead agree. Never reason, instead divert. Never shame, instead distract. Never lecture, instead reassure. Never say remember, instead reminisce. Never say I told you, instead repeat. Never say you can't, instead say what they can do. Never demand, instead ask. Never condescend, instead encourage. Never force, instead reinforce. Next. <clears throat> so behavioral management. We have cognitive and emotion-oriented interventions. That's the reminiscence therapy I mentioned earlier, and also validation therapy. That, that's if they've had a, a job, you know, a career, and you can focus maybe some of your discussion on that. Um, those kinds of things, they're going to remember um, long into the illness. Psychosocial interventions, pet therapy. If they still have their own pet or you have one, that's excellent. You can also buy robotic um, dogs now, which is probably easier because you don't have to feed them. You don't have to take them for a walk. You don't have to clean up after them, but they're great to snuggle with. And they look real. Exercise, of course is also a psychosocial intervention. And then there's sensory stimulation or relaxation interventions, aromatherapy, um, essential oils, and you can buy a diffuser where it's just diffused into the air. Some of the oils like lavender, peppermint are, are rather soothing. Also lemongrass, light therapy, use that during the day. Um, you know, have them sit in front of it if they'll sit for 20 minutes. Um, you can get a grow light at your big box stores, um, which is just as effective as the expensive um, lights that they sell for people with seasonal affective disorder. And then music therapy, it's so important. And what was or is their favorite music? Um, because um, basically the music that we loved as a teen in our early 20s is what we carry through um, the rest of our life. Next a little bit more on music therapy. Um, because even people that haven't spoken for a while may start singing the songs. Um, but it has been shown to increase awareness, cognition and engagement, reduce agitation, anxiety and other negative behaviors, reduce pain, boost the immune system, improve sleep, elevate mood. So we wanna play their favorite music again from when they were in their teens and early 20s. Next, a, a little word about end of life care because dementia is an end stage condition. So palliative care and hospice are available. They're covered. Oh. They're covered by, um, I don't even know how my timer got set. <laughs> um, they're covered by all insurances, Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurance. And the sad thing is only 11% of people with dementia are actually referred to hospice. And that's unfortunate, or they refer them way too late. Um, because um, as long as you have a doctor that is doing their best guesstimate to say you have six months or less to live, you qualify with an end-stage illness for hospice. And that way you get a full team approach, right? You've got nurse, you've got an aide helping with the bathing. You've got social service, you have spiritual counseling, you have volunteers that can give you a break. Um, but you have to know what, what does your loved one want? So it's important to have that discussion early, right? When people are able to um, express their wishes because most people like 90% wanna die at home. And if you can, you wanna honor it. Um, and hospice care is covered by Medicare and insurance and Medicaid. Um, and even if it's not in their home, maybe they're already in an assisted living or a nursing home, 
um, those facilities also allow it and allow the hospice team in. They may work with particular hospice groups, um, but if you have a certain one you wanna work with, you may be able to also work that out with the facility. Next, and pain management, of course, if there, but even if you don't have pain, hospice provides medications to reduce that anxiety and just um, make it a more peaceful transition. So help and care for the caregiver. Well, the Alzheimer's Association, they have a hotline 24 seven. They also have caregiver support groups and the number is 800-272-3900. And um, they are a tremendous resource. Um, family and friends to help if finances are limited. If the person has funds, spend the money on their care, hire a caregiver. This is their rainy day. This is what they worked hard for and saved for. There's community resources, depending on where you live. We have path lights. Um, it's no longer plows, I have to update my slide. Um, Catholic Charities, it just depends where you live, Department of Aging in Chicago, Will County has senior services, most suburbs have some kind of aging senior services available. An elder attorney if the dementia is very early, to be sure all documents are signed, powers of attorney, living will, estate planning, it needs to be done while the person still has capacity. Um, decisional capacity. That means they can understand the risks and benefits and actually still make an informed decision. If they can no longer do that, those documents can no longer be done because they don't have the capacity. And then it could get expensive. You may have to seek guardianship, especially if there's you know several family members and they don't all agree on the plan of care. You can hire somebody like me, an elder care coordinator. Um, there's also geriatric care managers and they help people navigate all of this and get the care and the services, work with the MDs and the family to make sure that all of the resource, resources and education and support is there for them. And respite, um, either place in a facility or if there's other families so that you can have a break. Um, and also um, time for placement. You know, you try not to promise that you'll never place them because you don't know what the behaviors or maybe the lack of funds, you know, the money could run dry, could run out. Um, and so there are free videos on activities for people with advanced dementia. Um, that's here in the slide. Um, there's a free family caregiver guide. The website is also on this slide. You might want to snap a picture with your phone. Um, I'll leave it up for a second or two. Next. <clears throat> and then caregivers bill of rights. People um, that are caregivers need to take care of themselves, right? You have to um, seek help from others. Put your oxygen mask on first, right? Just like on the plane and replenish yourself. Um, maintain if you can some facets of your own life and it's okay if you do get angry depressed and express difficult feelings occasionally just try not to do it so much with the person with dementia but hopefully a friend that doesn't mind uh, listening or maybe you need to set up sessions with a professional therapist um, so you have the right to reject any uh, attempt by your relative to manipulate you through guilt, anger, or depression. You have the right to receive consideration, affection, forgiveness, and acceptance for what you're doing for your loved one. And hopefully you're gonna get some of those qualities back in return. And if not from the person with dementia, maybe some other family or friends. And take pride in what you're accomplishing and applaud the courage it has taken. It is one of the toughest, toughest um, jobs that anybody will ever have. And you have the right to protect your individuality and your right um, to make a life. And consider yourself and consider the caregivers you know heroes, but they may not necessarily think of themselves that way. And ask them periodically where they're at in their journey. 
um, maybe ask them about something else in their life. <clears throat> Next, there are a lot of resources available. I've already talked about the Alzheimer's Association and their hotline. Um, some of the books, and there are a gazillion books these days. My Two Elaines by Martin Schreiber. He took care of his wife. Creating Moments of Joy by Jolene Brackey. That's really geared more for people going to facilities and they're kind of checking out facilities and what to look for. The 36 hour day has been around forever and ever and ever, but I believe um, a lot of the information in there is still very pertinent. Um, Patricia McClure Chessier, she's somebody I know through, through my work. She's written two books, um, Losing a Hero, the Story of Pearl about her journey with her mother with uh, dementia. And then she also wrote A Caregiver's Guide for Alzheimer's and Dementia, Nine Key Principles. Um, and there is a national alliance for caregiving, www.caregivers.org. I don't know if the Rush Caregiver Research Group is going on any longer. It was um, eight sessions and they were doing it um, virtually, WebExes. But you can um, go to rush.edu and, and see if it's still going on. But again, just a ton of other books and articles, um, ongoing research, um, Rush is one place. Also uh, Great Lakes is another um, provider that does a lot of research with dementia. Next. Now's the time if you have any questions, comments, you have an experience you might wanna share. And then just a note, since COVID is still in our midst, although um, you know, we were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with um, so many people getting vaccinated. However, there's enough people that aren't. So dementia itself does not increase anybody's risk for getting COVID. Um, However, if you know things change in their status, they suddenly have a fever, difficulty breathing, you know, you would want to take them to the emergency room. We do have the um, Delta variant that's um, still very prevalent, and now it's well over 50% of COVID cases are the um, Delta variant. So be sure to still um, get a flu shot. If you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated, maintain distance if you don't know if people are. It's okay to still wear a mask if you're going into stores or public places where it's iffy. Um, hand washing also. So um, you can unmute yourselves um, if you have any questions or comments. Marianne, it looks like you're trying to talk, but we can't hear you. Do you want to unmute yourself or can you? It might be in your lower left corner of your screen. It looks like a microphone and you just click on it and it should unmute you. No, let me, I'm going to press a button. It's going to ask you to unmute. Okay, Marianne. There you Is go. That, yep. yep. Now we can My, hear you. Oh, okay. You know, I I lost you just when you were, you know, getting into incontinence. Oh. And um, and I kind of missed because and I don't know what happened. Somehow I got cut off from the rest of the meeting. But I know you probably can't repeat all that. But it, is there some way I can recover that? Yes, because we recorded it. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So Megan's so, gonna, Megan can tell you how to get the recording. Yeah, it'll be posted on our website in the next few days, probably. Um, but I can definitely send that to you um, via email so that you did you, can... did you have right. a particular, particular well, right. question? Well, that's where my patient is right now. You know, it seems like uh, he's going through the uh, now that he can't really converse. And you kind of, you know, he's jumbling up words and it doesn't always make sense. So you're trying to figure out, you know, and so I'm trying, you know, be patient and it's, it's been working fine. Um, 
just as long as, you know, we go slow. But now, you know, he's at that point, too, where he gets up in the morning and he's going into the bathroom and he totally misses, you know. And, of course, I think we're at that point maybe where pull-ups might be mm -hmm. advantageous right now. So I'm, you know, trying to talk with his wife about that. But, um, you know, and then, as you say, every two hours we're going into the bathroom, et cetera. But um, to maintain his sense of dignity because he still wants to do it right. himself. And, and it, um, it may get to the point, even though men, I know, especially for urination, prefer to stand, it may just be where you have to sit him on the toilet, too. Yes, he is doing that. So yeah. we've talked. Yeah. But again, he's getting into that point, too, where uh, we've talked about Miralax because I think he's having problems with constipation. And you can tell because he's in the bathroom for 20 minutes and he's really wow. trying to push. Yeah. So I think, you know, he's not drinking a lot of water. And we've talked about I am a nurse. So mm -hmm. and I've been through this with my mom. She was 99 years old when she passed. So um, I can see, you know, these are. But he's much younger, certainly, but uh, but he's not interested in too much water. So we're talking about, you know, the different um, flavors of those right. new crystal light. You can mix with water. Um, I don't know how he does with carbonation, but, you know, the carbonated waters have a little bit of um, flavor to them also. And, you know, it's no sugar. It's zero calories. Mm -hmm. um, iced tea, you know. I mean, there's a lot of different, um, and even remember Jello, ice cream, um, milkshakes, yes. they're all liquids still. So, yeah, he's, he's at this, so, you know, his progression, I haven't seen him in maybe four months okay. because I had to go away and his wife has been, you know, maintaining with another, but um, I, you know, but she, I, the biggest thing is for me is the incontinence and certainly now the, the change, he cannot catch the words. Right. But, um, and of course now he's having a little issue with swallowing pills and capsules. So we're trying, you know, but the problem is I said many of these things are, um, what is it? Long acting. So they can't be poured. Brushed. And and he's trying to chew it, right? And then, you know, so I don't know, you know. Um, anyway. It may be a matter of putting them in, like the ice cream or the ice cream, right. where it can slide down. Because she's saying to me, "Well, my God, he takes it for you, but he doesn't take it for me." <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's so he's kind. He can do it at times. He forgets, right. and sometimes he, you know, he'll just I'll say, "Oh, take it with your orange juice," and he'll just swallow it down. And then when she comes home, she'll say, oh, my goodness, he doesn't do that for me. So it's just, yeah. The other thing is, does he need a swallow study? Because it could be where he's just having um, some problems with the swallowing. And you want to be careful then about the type of food and, and get the thicket for the liquid. So that, you know, um, people with dementia very rarely, yes, they write it down, but usually they die from something else. Maybe they have a stroke in, in the meantime, or often they will get um, bed sores, you know, at the end when they're really just bed bound and, um, and they've lost a lot of weight and they're very frail, or they get aspiration pneumonia, which is what kills them because of the swallowing problems. Right. So, and she hasn't really... Um, included, you know, he's been dealing with this now for 10 years. So I guess it's a slower progression, but yet well, um, she, she hasn't really got, um, you know, home health in yet, but I don't know if we're getting to that point where it might be wise to have a home health evaluation. I think they're trying to limit the amount of people right now. Sure. And especially, you know, people were very hesitant with the pandemic too to be bringing extra people into the mm -hmm. home. Um, he, he probably wouldn't qualify for skilled home health, you know, which is very short term mm -hmm. care, but hiring a caregiver to help um, help the spouse with um, with this care. And it may be just during the 
during the day or if it gets to the point where he's up at night and having problems, you know, so that the wife can sleep, you know, you just kind of have to gauge, mm -hmm. you know, what the needs are and it can change, of course. But yeah, there are some people that live as long as 20 years with the dementia, but most commonly it's about on average, it's about eight years. Yeah. He's taking, you know, she gives him Depakote. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's twice a day and that seems to make him tired. Yeah, it so, does. Yeah, that he wants to, you know, sleep then. But, um, but again, she's having difficulties during the night. Okay. That he wants to get up at 2.30 in the morning and, and he's wandered. And so she's alerted the police and a couple of times they've had to, okay. you know. So anyway, it's, but I was, you know, hoping to get some, and I am, you know, I've been writing down. And so I'll try and pick up where I left off in okay. a couple and of days or so. You have the, um, the wife also listened to the recording. Yes, she was going to. Okay. Now, I don't know how many Am I the only one? I only see my own, my, my well, picture a, up there. There's a few other people on the call too. Yeah. Okay. Because a I know familiar she, said, <laughs> she said, she said that she was, you know, going to possibly be interested in um, observing. Okay. So, but anyway, yeah, just, we want to get some ideas of strategies and, um, you know, the, what is good for his well-being and uh, that we're on the right track and, and assisting him in the safety. That was the other issue is the safety, because when he's standing there, you know, I can see that he's, we don't want him to slip and fall. Right. And, uh, so I don't, uh, you know, just to get be there so that when he does either direct him, I mentioned maybe possibly a urinal, but I don't know if, you know, if, if the urinal is, I don't know. I guess we could introduce or, it. The, or a bedside commode even, so he doesn't have to go that far, you know, if, if there's room to put it next to the bed even. Yes. It's just, I don't know that he'll, you, you know, that's the thing, introducing, if that would confuse him enough because he's used to going into the bathroom and this is not uh, changing his overall, uh, uh, you know, his daytime. Mm -hmm. Uh, what he's used to doing his I'm trying to think of the word his routine <laughs> yes his routine so because he went you know and he's so anyway but I just wanted to get some ideas and strategies and I think you know that we're on the right track and and helping him as much as we can and then there was there's some alternative because that came after incontinence also some alternative treatments and using music music therapy and um also, you know, going to a doctor that is willing to work with medical marijuana, they're having good results um, with that. So there are some other um, other things besides the psych meds. Mm -hmm. Okay, but and that's something, yeah, we can discuss with his wife. Mm -hmm. But um, now, so in, in the next couple of days, then I'll just check with Megan, and then see if I can pick it up from where I left off. Yeah, I'll try and email it out too. I'll try and email a link out um, to you, Marianne. Yes, and um, and I again, looking at some of the um, bibliography that you talked about, different uh, different uh, books and ideas. Oh, I've kind of lost, I've lost you again, picture wise, but I'm here, I'm in the sound, but I know I, I wrote down two books that you had mentioned. 